Well, let's pray. Uh, Father, as we come to your word now, would you please uh, calm all of our hearts and minds so that we might be able to hear what you have to say to us. Please guard my words and my motivations. Um, and Father, please, we pray that you'd make us into the people that you want us to be through this part of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've been really heartened to see uh, the way that James has been received amongst us over the last month. Um, it's been hard work at times. But I think the reason that James connects with us is because he's got our number. He zeroes in on our hearts and minds and our tongues and how we treat others. And the book of James sings and stings. And I wonder if you were James writing a letter to a bunch of churches scattered through the world, how would you finish the letter? Would you give them a last blast um, or an encouraging word or, or would you just go for it? Well, what James does is to give us the fullest teaching on prayer in the letter. He reminds us of our dependence on God and he wants to connect us secondly with each other. And he sets the teaching on prayer squarely within the Christian community. So just scan down to verse 13. Is anyone among you? And again, verse 14, anyone among you? Verse 16, each other. You see, when James teaches about prayer, he teaches about prayer in the context of the community. And this is the heart of the matter. Prayer is our most basic response of faith in God. But look at the last two verses. Verse 19. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Here's true pastoral care. It's not reserved for the professionals, for the clergy or the you know, elders or some other group of people. It's for everyone. And we need this ministry. We all wander. And it might begin intellectually, but it doesn't really matter where it starts. Something as simple as missing church for a couple of weeks for as good a reason as COVID. And James wants us to be involved and engaged in rescuing each other. Because, as he says, the stakes are high, saving from death and a multitude of sins, and we can't do that on our own. That's why we need each other, and it's why the teaching on prayer here is right in the, set in the middle of the community. It's why we need to pray. So he finishes the letter with prayer. Not, not a technique. Effectively, he just says pray. Now, if you've been a Christian for a while, you know that verses 14 to 15, a bit of a battleground in Christian churches for different positions on sickness and healing and... I reckon that different sides have probably hijacked these verses a bit. In one corner is the Roman Catholic Church, which tries to uh, well, ground the Roman Catholic sacrament of anointing with oil with these verses. Extreme unction is what it used to be called. The, the, the teaching about which goes much further than what James actually says here. When a person's dying, a priest takes specially set aside oil and dabs it on five parts of the body, giving an official pardon for sin in the hope that the person might escape purgatory and go straight to heaven. Now, I don't want to get sidetracked here, but can I just say, this cannot be what James has in mind here. Because he's talking about returning the person to health in some form. So they live. In the other corner, some have taken verse 15 as a kind of magic bullet. You know, if we've got enough faith, we're going to heal the sick person no matter what they've got. And if we pray for someone and it doesn't happen, then that means that either we don't have enough faith or our prayers aren't using the right formula or there's somebody present who's not with the program. And you might have been part of those meetings like I have been, and they're terrible. And it gives rise to what we call faith healers and all the cons that go along with them and healing services that point not to Christ but anything but. So what I want to do briefly today is to put these verses in their context and to see their point 
these verses are about prayer, after all. They're not about me and you in that sense. Seven times James mentions prayer. And we're going to look at small prayers and big prayers and middle-sized prayers. So first of all, small prayers, verse 13. He writes, is anyone in trouble or happy? I mean, what's the highly complicated thing that he says to do in either case or anywhere in between? Pray. See, James takes both ends of our human experience and everything in between and says, talk to God wherever you're at. Bring your situation to God. Refer them to God. Because there's no circumstance in which God is not involved and there's no situation about which God does not care. He is your heavenly Father. He knows what's going on before we do and he wants us to trust him in all circumstances. It was Karl Barth who said, God calls us to live with him and our answer is in prayer, Father, I desire to live with you. So you, you won't enjoy genuine and lasting relationship with God if you don't pray constantly. And God takes pleasure in these little prayers. And think of what happens when we don't pray like this. When things are tough, we cry out, woe is me. We cry out to ourselves or into the emptiness, which is only self-pity, unless it's directed to God in prayer. And then when things are going well, we cry out, yippee, look at me, look what I've done. Self-congratulatory. It's really a kind of spiritual amnesia, unless it's directed towards God. It's pretty simple, what James is saying. Prayer is speaking to God. Do it. And we hear from God through his word and his Holy Spirit applies it to our hearts and we respond in prayer, confident that God will hear because of Jesus. And there's nothing in our experience that doesn't concern God or about which he has not invited us to talk with him. Lately, my lovely wife has been talking to me about my cynicism. And I think she's right. You know, it's, it's part of the great blessing of having a godly woman who knows you and still loves you and speaks the truth in love. And, you know, I've been reflecting on it. What can I do about that? And I, and I think those little prayers are the antidote to cynicism. And it's my goal at the moment. And I, I think the real reason we don't pray small prayers is that for some reason, we doubt the real, of active and continuous and present goodness of God, probably because we think of ourselves too much. We might think, though, that God's only concerned with the big things, you know, threat level four or above. So maybe we save up the ammunition for those kind of circumstances. We, we think it's right to try and deal with the other stuff on its own. And I think it's very normal, actually, in our culture where being self-reliant is a much vaunted quality. But if we don't pray these small prayers... We move from being encouragers to being commentators and critics. And we really want to undercut that. So start today. If you're like me, start today. Sit down and take a piece of paper and write down five ways that God has blessed you today and tell him. And you know... Uh, Within a short time, five will become 20. Are any of you in trouble? Pray. And if you're happy, you sing praises. Oh, not at the moment, though, if you're in church. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, little prayers, big prayers. See, in verses 17 to 18, we hear about Elijah. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. James takes the Old Testament figure Elijah as his illustration. Why? Well, it's true. God wants us to bring all the details of our lives to him. But the purpose of prayer is not so that every moment I'll be happy and my problems solved. God's bigger purpose is that even in hardships, now, his bigger purpose in hardships is to advance the only cause that's ultimately worth giving our lives to. 
and that is the glory of God through his gospel and in his kingdom. And we devalue prayer if we only ever make it about what I want. You know, the uh, Bible study that turns to prayer and actually it becomes an organ recital. You know, Lord, we pray for Martha's big toe and Harry's back and Jim's skin cancer and on it goes. Have a look back with me at chapter 4, verse 2. Here's, here's a church full of people fighting and quarrelling with each other. Not the world out there, but internally. And James says to them, you do not have because you do not ask God. And the reason they didn't ask and the reason we don't ask is because I think we already know what we want to do. Why would we pray about that? Where we'll live or we might go on holidays in verse 3, chapter 4, verse 3, when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Do you see? What they're praying for is their own passions and pleasures. The hedonism in them drives their prayers. So why does James give us Elijah in chapter 5? Well, what did Elijah pray for? He uh, prayed for the weather, actually. <laughs> For it to change and then change again. Oh, what's going on? Well, Elijah lived at one of the darkest times of the history of Israel when Ahab became king. And like so many of the kings, he led the people away from the Lord. But worse, because in 1 Kings 16.30, we read, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. This is indeed dark days. Now, Elijah wasn't perfect. Um, James said he's just like us. Actually, he's the great example of self-pity, I think. But the Lord taught him to pray for what God wanted for his people. And it was through Elijah's prayers that God did things of massive impact and power. God spoke to Elijah and told him to pray, pray for drought, and he did. And the nation was brought to its knees through a multi-year drought and back to God. And so our James passage begins with small prayers and moves to big prayers that turn whole nations back to the true and living God. In those days, if you prayed for no rain, actually, it meant economic ruin. And that's what he did, so that the people might recognise they don't live by their own strength. You know, that's like play, praying for a pandemic. So people might turn to the word of Christ. Oh, wait. It's not a trivial prayer, is it? You see, there's nothing bigger than we could pray for than people coming to know and trust God to be rescued from darkness to light. And we know that matters most to God because that is why he sent his son, even though Jesus would go to the cross in pursuing that purpose. Now, Jesus taught us to pray, yes, for our daily bread. But before that, we pray for his kingdom, for his name and his will. You see, it's one of the great privileges of belonging to Jesus that we, we've been shared with God's eternal cosmic purposes. And even after we die, think about this. Our prayers continue to be acted on by God. You know, the Disney sop on death is uh, when someone dies, they live on in our memories. And that's true. Or maybe the Lion King, you know, he lives in you, he lives in me. Uh, now, really, that's, that's mostly the sentimentality of the mid-20th century Americans telling kids stories to make money. But the truth is, your prayers live on, not in us, but in the mind of God, who... Uh, listen to Wesley. Wesley said, God does nothing except in response to godly prayer. Now, praying for peace in somewhere like Syria is a good thing to do. But you know, it's even better to pray for peace in Syria so that the knowledge of God might be spread through his people witnessing. See, we have the most amazing privilege 
of coming before God and laying before him our concerns. And when we do that, we actually find that his concerns become our concerns and we are caught up in the biggest possible concerns of spreading his glory. And the reason James says Elijah is a man just like you and me is because you and I can pray these big prayers for God's big purposes, do you see? This is not just for the big people, you know, professional prayers, prayer warriors, or the big people in the Bible. God is concerned for our small prayers, and he invites us to pray these big prayers. And he'll even continue to answer them long after we've gone to be with him. Small prayers, big prayers, middle-sized prayers, just very quickly. And don't drift off like Goldilocks after she got the porridge. Um, Look, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you will probably know that God, our Heavenly Father, answers prayers for physical healing today in miraculous ways. I've stood by the bedside of people who should have been dead, who should have died after that point, for whom there was no hope. One head trauma in the Kimberley comes to mind in particular. Uh, and frankly, there can be no other explanation. It's, it's God's gracious intervention. But we've also seen God not answer prayers in the terms that we've prayed. We've prayed in exactly the same ways in the person's died. And as we come to this middle section, we, we, we need to see its place between small prayers and big prayers. And I think it's a transition passage. And what's so interesting is that James is deliberately using words in this section that can actually refer to physical sufferings or spiritual uh, and uh, physical suffering and physical healing or spiritual suffering and spiritual healing and the key is that we actually keep this together but it's pretty easy to keep wanting to separate the two and James I think helps us by showing things in kind of three frames a close-up a a mid-range a portrait and then the long distance shot so he starts close up is any among you sick Verse 14, and if someone's sick, they're to summon the elders to come to them for private prayer. Here's an intimate setting, close up. It's not a big healing event. It's not a meeting that the sick come to. The elders come and pray over the person. Then they go to the pantry and get some good old olive oil. That's what the word here means or is. And they put some on and they pray over the person and the prayer will save them. Now, every time James uses this salvation word, It always means salvation from sin and death and judgment because of sins. This is not a magic formula to teach us to know how to force God to do something that we want. But it shows how in all things, how to bring where we are, how to bring where we're at spiritually before him and point us forward to what's in God's heart, which is sin and forgiveness through Jesus. See, just just hang on a minute. Um, if you're bored, now's the time to go to sleep. Um, if James is just focusing on the physical, he uses the wrong bit of Elijah's life to illustrate it. See, the weather and the drought, they were just one of many things that happened in Elijah's life. They're kind of right out there. But Elijah was also housed by a widow during the drought whose only son died and Elijah prayed and raised him to life. And the widow said, Now I know you're a man of God and your word is truth. That's the illustration James should have used if he was talking about just healing people physically. I'm trying to wake up now. See, in our physical frailty, James wants to keep drawing us to God's provision, to his gospel, to relationship with Jesus that outlasts even death. And that's the close-up. And then in verses 15 and 16, James moves us out of the private home and then outwards to the lives of all in the congregation, from the ministry of the elders to one person, to all our ministry, to each other. So here's a picture of someone who wants to come clean with God. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. There's a beautiful picture here of something that goes on amongst God's people where rifts between people are healed. I wonder if you've ever done this. 
You might have gossiped about somebody or spoken slander or complaint. You might not have loved them as you should. And James says you need to go to that person, the person you've sinned against, and seek them out and ask them to forgive you. And then pray together. Because it's in prayer, bringing our wounds into the presence of God, that any breach can be healed. You ever done that? I can't believe we haven't sinned against each other, although perhaps we don't spend enough time together for that to happen very much. Or have you ever had anybody do that to you, come to you and confess their sin against you? Perhaps that would be a surprise. And you need to be ready to forgive, to value restoration, to pray, to be willing to pray together. But do you see how valuable the restored community is to James? And we need to treasure it too. But we can only continue in fellowship if we confess our sins and pray with one another. I don't mean the general confession, which is a very good thing to do. I actually mean two Christians sitting together, confessing their sins. Well, as we wrap up James, James in January, I hope as we step back and look at what James is saying, we see a community of contrast with three key things about it. First, it's a community that hates. It hates sin because sin divides. It cuts me up, but it also splits me from others, from you, and it separates me from God. Secondly, James says the community, this community of contrast, has a deep and enduring care for each other. And it, it's stunning in verse 20 in giving us a spiritual care for each other. God almost, it seems, delegates his entire work to us. And I, I just want to point out how countercultural that is. We live in a postmodern culture, so it's been called. And there's stacks of stuff written about it. But a bloke called Robert Bork writes this. There are two things that characterise our culture, radical individualism and radical egalitarianism. And through politics, they shatter a society into fragments of isolated individuals and angry groups. And isn't that our world? The kind of society that we're growing and that we live in at the moment is never happier unless there's only the people we like around us. And even then, I'm not so sure about you. But James's concern is to connect us. And speaking as somebody who has wandered away from the truth, it is so wonderful to have somebody love you enough to confront you and to turn you back. I praise God for Dan. A community that hates sin, a community that cares for each other, and lastly, a community that prays. Small prayers, middle-sized prayers, big prayers. The weakest one of us, with the tiniest faith, to the Most High God. Of course, prayer starts with God. He moves us to pray by His Spirit. And through Jesus, our prayers come to our Father, and we know that when God is going to do a great thing among us, he will move us to pray in a particular way. And so I want to invite you this year to commit yourself to prayer. As a church, we're going to be doing this starting in February, 40 days before Easter. We're going to put out some prayer points to stimulate and help that. We're going to have some events on. There'll be more information about that later on. But basically for... Each Wednesday night of those 40 days, those of us who can get together, get together. And they will be asking God to make us what he wants us to be for his honour and praise. So why don't you join us? Amen.